Earlier, I spoke with the Lithuanian Foreign Minister, Gabrielis Landsbergis, who was at the meeting in Brussels, who told me that there is no other solution but a two-state solution. I support uh, the position of European Union that there is no other solution rather than two-state solution. Uh, and um, if, um, if we want to see um, Israel safe, if we want to see people uh, of Palestine safe, and if we want to see the region um, as a whole uh, safe and secure, we have to we have to take this decision. Uh, and of course, we have seen heavy diplomacy uh, of Secretary Blinken in the region uh, in the last several weeks, where we are continuing to see tensions escalate in the region from Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, as well to the Houthis uh, in, in Yemen with attacks in Iran, I should say, and attacks in Syria. How concerned are you about the developments that we have been seeing in the Red Sea and the potential for this to escalate further, Minister? Well, it's truly worrying, especially um, that there are at least a couple of actors, uh, you know, not necessarily at the front of the scene, but behind the scenes who are uh, heavily invested so that this conflict is prolonged as much as possible. You're talking Iran? You're referring to Iran? I'm talking about not just, not just Iran, but Iran, yes, and but also Russia. You know, I'm, you know it, I find it incredibly worrying when I see Russia openly meeting, you know, Russia's officials openly meeting with the representatives from Hamas, you know, and discussing what. Uh, and, you know, they're having these, these conversations. And, and honestly, I think that Russia is profiting from the fact that, uh, you know, the West now has to deal with number number of crises. How and is it profiting? How, Minister, just expand on that. How is it profiting? What is what is the game here? What, are, what what's the strategy from Russia, in your view? For for Russia, us being uh, you know immersed in, in difficult debates, not able to find a quick solution, you know, because that's the way democracies you know tend to work. Mm. For them, uh, distracting us from from Ukraine works you know works perfectly. Then you have practical issues. Right. So Israel has to be supported with, you know, by by certain allies with uh, with ammunition. And, you know, and it's it's evident that that ammunition, you know, half a year ago would have gone to uh, to Ukraine and, and sustain their war effort. And now they're facing so, so many difficulties. And I, I think that, you know, at least one one or the other bottle of champagne is being opened in Kremlin whenever we we are divided. Minister, always great to get your insight. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And in just a few minutes, we'll have more from my conversation with Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergis, this time on how his country, as well as other Baltic states, are planning to reinforce their borders against neighboring Belarus as well as Russia. You don't want to miss that interview. Well, Baltic countries are taking measures to defend themselves against future threats from Russia as well as Belarus. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania signed an agreement earlier, reinforcing their borders to deter and defend against military threats. I want to take you back to my conversation with the Lithuanian Foreign Minister, Gabrielis Landsbergis, who is in Brussels with a mission to re-energize EU support for Ukraine. I spoke with him about why his country is reinforcing their borders now, almost two years into Russia. Russia's war in Ukraine. We are talking about uh, counter mobility uh, measures. That mm. means that we have to make um, certain measures that would uh, make moving into Lithuania quite and, and other Baltic states uh, more difficult. Because when, when you think of it, um, Lithuania, uh, just alone with uh, just with Belarus, we have more than 600 kilometers border. And it's a lot of border to cover, but also it provides an ample opportunities for. A potential adversary to uh, uh, to choose to go in. So now we have uh, in place uh, electronic systems. Uh, we have uh, uh, structures already, but they do not. They would not be able to stop uh, heavy equipment. Uh, they would not be able to stop tanks. And this is what uh, what uh, our military people have in mind. How much is those concerns driven by the fact that one you have? Well, the war in Ukraine has somewhat become a stalemate, but also those requests that we have heard, Minister, uh, from uh, President Zelensky calling for desperately needed US European funding. Um, and I wonder whether you're confident, the conversations that you're having, the kind of chorus of power, how confident are you that this aid, be it from the EU, um, be it from the US, that that will come through? 
Well, uh, I can speak about EU currently because today I'm in Brussels and we have a Foreign Affairs Council where we've talked about uh, what is called the European Peace Facility, which was a founded instrument when the war started in a way how to fund uh, Ukrainian uh, war effort uh, fastest and most in, in most efficient uh, fashion. We weren't able to continue with this instrument for almost half a year. But today, during the discussions, and the, institu the, the European Commission has offered a new instrument, an amended instrument, that I'm, at this point I'm optimistic that it could find uh, enough support in, in Europe. And, even with uh, Hungary? And be, even with Hungary, Minister? Even, even with Hungary. I mean, I don't want you know, to say that it's final. It's yeah. the first day of debate. Uh, obviously, but I'm, you know, my point was during the discussion that it's incredibly important that Europe would have this instrument. And today it is for, for Ukraine. It's needed for Ukraine, desperately needed. But tomorrow it could be needed for Europe yeah. so that Europe would also have an instrument to defend itself. So we need we need this message. We need this instrument. I'm truly hopeful that it will it will come through. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not just um, funding in the EU and also in the US. It's also a US election that we have. And I wonder if that plays to some of your concerns. We heard from former President Donald Trump, who is, of course, at the moment, the kind of the leading Republican candidate, according to the latest polls, who had previously said, and you know this very well, Foreign Minister, that he wanted out of NATO and reportedly threatened not to protect Europe if it were attacked. What would a Trump presidency mean for Europe and for Ukraine, you think? Well, last time uh, when uh, President Trump was um, um, running the administration, the worst fear, fears of, uh, of eastern flank did, did not materialize. Uh, so it's, it's early to say whether you know, we should be really, you know, how worried we should be. I've, I've mentioned this, that if the um, United States would change its posture in, uh, in the eastern flank or you know, in, in Europe, uh, you know, I could call it a nightmare scenario, especially in these geopolitical circumstances that we we are facing. Um, United States is needed more more than ever in Europe uh, because we're facing an aggressive neighbor, a country that was uh, showing aggressive signs, but not to the extent that we currently see. And uh, if they test NATO, uh, if they test NATO, and we do not have a a, a real response, if we would fail to meet the test. Um, then the world enters a, a very um, dark, dark times. And I, I'm still hopeful that this will not happen. I'm grateful to the foreign minister for that interview.